of Cornell University. So we've been asking, where does the proton come from? Or where does the acidity come from? And we've also been asking, you know, what's the distribution? Okay. So the next thing I'd like to ask is, what is going on in the environment to produce a specific pH at one place versus another? And what are the consequences of that pH? Okay. So we don't have to do the buffering reprise because we just basically did it. So what are those consequences? There are a number of different consequences out there. I'm going to be talking pr primarily about biological effects, but there are a number of different effects out there. From a biological sense, plant growth, nutrient availability, as well as some deleterious effects, primarily toxicity issues. But some of those other effects, certainly as the si soils get more acidic, what am I going to start seeing weathering-wise? I'm going to see an increase in weathering. If I see an increase in weathering, I'm certainly going to see an increase in nutrients, but I'm also going to potentially be watching a lot of those nutrients leave the system. Okay? Certainly as the pHs go up, I'm certainly going to start seeing toxicity issues. Okay? Now, <coughs> let's start with plant growth. And to start with plant growth, I'm going to start with this slide right here. Okay? The top part of this basically represents acidity. The blue line represents proton concentration. This black line basically represents hydroxide concentration. As the blue, as the protons increase, the pH is going down. Okay? Now, interestingly enough, there's a direct correspondence to pHs and nutrient availability. Okay? This is overall nutrient availability. Now, there are how many different nutrients are there, macronutrients and micronutrients. We're basically looking at all of these in total. And you'll notice as, as this line goes up, there's more and more availability. You'll notice that someplace around 6.5 is the maximum amount of total nutrient availability. That's not to say that one nutrient, it doesn't, it's not to say that every single nutrient is at its maximum availability. It's all of the nutrients in total combined What's the maximum availability? And it happens to be around 6.5. Interestingly enough, this is not su super surprising, as you, you get a plant response. Maximum plant response, someplace around 6.57, because that's where the nutrients, maximum nutrient availability is. Kata. It depends on the plant. Certain plants have different nutrient needs. But overall, when you look at all the plants, combine all the different varieties of plants, Agronomic plants as well as non-agronomic plants, trees versus herbaceous, annuals, perennials, they all tend, when you put them on, some of them are going to perform better over here, but this is the total of plants. All plants in total, this is the total of nutrients, all nutrients in total. Okay? Now, we will, in fact, be talking about specific plants versus spe specific nutrients. And let's talk about the nutrients first. This is a chart showing the availability of specific nutrients. Okay? As I move over here, you can see acidity. This is proton concentration very large. As these arrows get, or these bars get wider, I'm seeing more availability. Okay? So acidity versus alkalinity. As this bar gets wider, I'm seeing more and more protons. Uh, uh, hydroxide, sorry. Okay? Now the width of the bar basically represents the availability of that individual element or chemical, whatever, hydroxide. Okay? So you'll note that generally in the middle, pretty much all of them are somewhat narrow. But when you add all of the middles up together, that's why you get that large peak here. Okay? It's all of them in total. Another way of looking at this is this. This is out of your book. But these are those bars again. And you'll note that, yes, zinc is much more abundant here and a lot less abundant there. But it's got that much there. And the barium, uh, boron actually tends to be higher in the middle. Copper ha tends to be higher in the middle. Molybdenum tends to be higher over here. Iron and manganese, much higher at this end. Aluminum, much higher at this end. Aluminum is also higher availability here. Phosphorus, bracketing, calcium, magnesium getting bigger at this end. You're adding all of them together, and that's where you get this curve. That's where you get this curve. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. Oh. <coughs> so 
If you look at all these nutrients, it turns out that at the high pHs, macronutrients, the availability, at, I should say, at high pHs, the availability of macronutrients is maximized. Okay, so when you're at a low pH, the availability of macronutrients are limited. Okay? At high pHs, the availability of micronutrients are limited, and at low pHs, the availability of micronutrients are high. Does that make sense? Yeah. A different way of saying it. Low pHs, lots of micronutrients. High pHs, lots of macronutrients. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, how does this, in fact, affect plant growth? Growth. Well, there can be some direct impacts. Foliate damage when I have really high acidity, so if I have acid rain or something like that, the acid is actually literally going to damage the plants. And I will also have root damage at pHs that are lower than 4. Indirectly, and this is actually more importantly, because our pHs generally, yes, we do tend to have pHs at these ends, but generally most of our soils tend to be in this middle zone. Okay? So we're really not going to have a lot of direct impact of acidity on our plants, but we're going to get a lot of indirect acidity. And most of that has to do with either too much of something or not enough of something. First example here, we have aluminum, where the aluminum, I have too much aluminum, and the aluminum is going to cause stunting in my plants. If I don't have enough of something, and the example here is calcium, I am going to have stunting in my shoots and tops. Molybdenum, molyb manganese, sorry, not molybdenum, manganese can also be toxic to plants, and I also can have issues with molybdenum deficiencies. Okay? I'll show you some examples of this. Now, in general, plants try to adapt. Okay? And certain plants are more adapted at certain parts of the environment than others. Legumes are generally intolerant of acidity. On the other hand, maize is fairly tolerant. So different plants will move into different environments and be more successful or less successful based upon these issues. Less this, but mostly this. And more importantly, this. The availability of those nutrients. Plants have a considerable range that they can live in. And this table right here basically shows you a variety of different plants and their optimum ranges of pHs. This is strongly acidic. This is slightly alkaline, slightly uh, sort of mid-range, 6 to 7 plus. Okay? These plants down here <coughs> at the low pHs, these tend to be plants that have either adapted or require something that's available at the low pHs. Does that make sense? Things like blueberries, pine trees. Species with high calcium needs require high pHs. Why? Calcium is available at high pHs. Okay? Species that have optimum ranges in the lower pHs, they're typically forest species from humid regions and they have either developed, probably both of them, they have developed a tolerance for high aluminum, because there's low pHs, there's going to be a lot more aluminum in the soil, and they also have, probably have a requirement for higher amounts of iron. This is the, the evergreen trees. Okay? It turns out that most of our cultivated crops are, are adapted to the slightly acidic range, 5.5 five to 7. Okay? Why? happens to be where we have selected those crops from. The environment that those crops come from tends to have a pH of 5, 5 to 7. That's not all of them, but many of them. Question in the back? No? All right. <clears throat> so let's, issue, let's take a look at some of these toxicities. This slide is terrible because you can't see the bottom slides, but this is pH down here, and this is calcium. Okay, this white space right in here is basically sort of the optimum availability of calcium. It's at the range of basically neutral pH. But what you're seeing here is this black line, but the, all these spots basically represent calcium availability as the pH goes up. 
All right, now let's look at the response in plants. This is from your book. This is a plant that has calcium deficiency. Look what's happening to its root structure. Okay, now this is not a toxic effect. This is a lack of calcium. Okay, so positive, this is the presence of calcium, no calcium. Another, uh, another slide from your book. Basically, this is a calcium or a boron deficiency, but you can see the twist in the corn. Direct response to pH and pH's effect on the nutrients, the nutrient availability. Okay, now that's the high, that's the sort of the calcium end of the spectrum. Let's actually take a look at the iron end of the spectrum or the lower end. Okay, this is out of your book as well, and basically what we're looking at is responses to aluminum. Okay, now this t slide right over here basically shows a positive response to calcium hydroxide or an aluminum sensitivity, and these are negative or no response. Okay, and this is basically the root response. Basically, a higher number basically means that I'm getting a better performance. Okay, here are the plant species honey locust, white spruce, gray dogwood, cedars, hickories, sugar maples. Okay, I start with the soil. Does it say it's pH? You no, it starts at an initial of 3.8, okay? And I start adding calcium hydroxide, a liming agent, and seeing what's happening, okay? You can see a huge positive response as I start liming these soils, which basically says that these plants are having serious issues due to that pH, primarily from aluminum sens sensitivity. Now, these plants over here, when I start liming, I get a negative response. Now, is that saying that they like aluminum, or is it saying something else? What happens to my micronutrients when I start raising the pH? What am I going to be doing to things like iron? It's going to be less available, and as it becomes less available, it's not necessarily the issue of the aluminum. They have the tolerance. But because iron becomes less available, my plant's performance decreases. Andrew. When you, when you add the calcium, why is aluminum less of a problem? Is it just being attached to the soil solids and it's not available anymore? Well, if I start raising the pHs, where is the aluminum going to be going? Probably the cation exchange or potentially being buffered out or lost from the system. Cool? Good example of this response. Micronutrient need. Macronutrient need. Here's a response of uh, this is actually what aluminum does. Okay, it's uh, it's what it does is it basically blocks calcium transport into the plants. Okay, and it binds with the this aluminum will bind with the ATP that's in the in your body. I mean, ATP is the energy of the cells, right? Okay, if aluminum binds with it, the plants can't use it, and they can't get the calcium into the system either. So as a result, what I have, this part of, don't look at this part of it. What, as a result, what I have is I have problems with plant basically growing. The cells won't expand. I can't get calcium into the system, and I don't have any energy. Okay. Now, this chart basically here is the aluminum in the soil solution versus the soil, it's just the soil pH. Okay. Just so that you can see what's going on, as the pH goes down, the aluminum concentration in the soil solution dramatically increases. Okay. Now they also threw this one in here, just so you can see sort of this blip of this reaction. Okay. pH here is about four five. Right about here is pH four five. As the pH drops more, we lose this. It moves to this. As the pH drops more, we lose this, we move to that. So basically what you're seeing is you're seeing that response of aluminum going into solution through this sequence. OK? Questions? Cool? Now, interestingly enough, if you look at this, it turns out that aluminum is rarely a problem when pH is above 5.2. Well, why? Above 5.2, you 
there isn't any really aluminum in the soil solutions. <coughs> All right, let's look at aluminum. This is what happens to the plants. These are tolerant plants versus sensitive plants, tolerant versus sensitive. And you're basically looking at a different pHs. Okay, this is pH 4.4, this is pH 5.2. Remember at 5.3, 5.2 is where we start seeing those responses. Sensitive plant at 5.7 looks a little bit less than the tolerant plant, but not that much. You get to 4.4, same species, look what happens to the plants. I'm not being, a, I can't pump in calcium, the aluminum's blocking that. The aluminum's interacting with my ATP, so I can't use the energy. And then finally, it resists or prevents me from enla or enlarging my cells. And this is the type of plant that ends up with, if you have all three of those things hitting you. Questions? Cool? Now, <clears throat> from a management sense, Okay, we're still, we're looking at aluminum still, okay, and this is soil pH, but what we're looking at here is two different soils, one with no organic matter and one with organic matter. Now, we're trying to start integrating some information here, okay. Why do you think I'm having, it, with no organic matter, starting at pH 6 down to about a pH 4, look at the amount of aluminum that are going right into solution versus the 10%. What's going on? What? Aluminum is binding to the organic matter. Why in specific? What happens when the pH goes down and you have a pH dependent charged molecule? Remember this? Okay, let's imagine this is an organic matter. It's attached to an O. Here's the end of the structure, okay? This is our carboxylic or something like that. What's gonna happen when the pHs start to drop? pH is going down, my concentration of protons are going up, right? What's gonna happen as the pH goes down? <coughs> What's gonna happen to the, my pH dependent charge? Any thoughts? You guys remember pH dependent charge? It gets more negative, right? Does it? You guys tell me. As the pH goes down, what happens to pH dependent charge? What happens when the pH dependent charge, what happens when the pH starts going up? If I start, the pH starts going up. I'm going to be increasing the concentration of OH, right? What's that OH going to do? No, no, no bites. If the pH goes down, the charges are more positive. As the pH goes down, the charge becomes more positive. The proton's going to add here, right? Correct? No? Yes? No? So what's going on with the aluminum? I should not have gone this way, should I have? Is it just too early in the morning? What? No? Well, the aluminum's, what's, how, what's going on? The, the answer is correct. The answer is the aluminum is going to be binding with the hydroxide. Right? Okay. It's going to be, the aluminum's going to be taken out of solution, so as a result, as that pH starts dropping, forget about that, okay? As the pH starts dropping, I get more and more aluminum into the soil solution, okay? That aluminum with no, oxygen, with no organic matter is going to go straight into toxic effects. It's going to start interacting with these plant roots. It's going to stop pumping calcium or preventing calcium being pumped. It's going to bind with the ATP. It's going to prevent cell elongation and cell enlargement, okay? But I have organic matter. What's going to happen? That aluminum is going to bind with the, the aluminum is going to bind with the organic matter, and it's going to reduce the amount of aluminum that's on the soil solution. And so as a response, I'm going to have less of a toxic effect. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. 
So the organic matter is, in essence, it's not truly a buffer, but in essence, it's acting. It's, it's, not, it's not a buffer for the protons. It's a buffer for the aluminum. It's binding with the aluminum. So why is the pH lower? Also on this graph, why is the pH lower with the organic matter? The pH isn't lower with the organic matter. At this pH, at this pH, pH of 5, when I have organic matter, when I don't have organic matter, we're basically seeing that I have different exchangeable aluminum. Okay? This, read it this way in that sense. Go. And that's because of the pH dependent charge on the Yeah, I, I think I shouldn't have gone that direction. I think, yeah, I want you to think it's really binding. The aluminum's binding with the organic matter. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.